My name is Wayne Johnson. Welcome back to our series on the principles of swine disease control. The subject for today is antibiotics and antimicrobials and antibiotic alternatives and appropriate applications. I appreciate your time and patience, and hopefully well, there will be something in what we say today in this somewhat lengthy lecture that will be of some interest and help to you. The foundational principle of antimicrobial therapy is that infectious diseases are caused by pathogenic microorganisms. Antimicrobials are chemicals of man-made or natural origin from plants or trees or microorganisms or dug out of the ground. Wherever it is that the antimicrobials that are used in antimicrobial therapy might come from, their purpose is to destroy the pathogens that cause disease without destroying the patient as well. Much of the present controversy regarding the use of antimicrobials derives from the lack of future utility, and I might say future futility, that is the result of the widespread use of antimicrobials and the genetic selection for resistance among the pathogens at which antimicrobial therapy has been directed. There has been a lot of use and abuse of antimicrobials in the animal industries since they first emerged in a major way in the 1950s. Some several million pounds of antimicrobials were administered to animals in the most recent year for which we have what passes for data on the subject. A similar in magnitude but smaller amount of antibiotics was used in the human population in that same year for which we have data. The purpose of the discussion that I am bringing to you today is to look at the history of antibiotics, which to some extent has been entangled with the history of medicine and veterinary medicine as we know it and also to consider how we might modify the behavior and operations of farms such that the dependency upon antibiotics might be reduced in some way. It has been clear for many years now that the hourglass of the antibiotic age has been running out, and there is not as much sand left to pass through it as there once was. We have known for a long time that we needed to find alternatives to antibiotics, not just alternatives in terms of some sleight of hand in the clever nomenclature so that we might say that compound X is not really an antibiotic or it's not really an antimicrobial, but rather it's some alternative. Well, actually what we're looking for is an alternative in terms of the way that we do things and how we looked at the way that diseases are produced and prevented. Some wise fellow said quite a few years ago that there was nothing new under the sun. Perhaps he meant that we ought to look somewhere else for a new thing being done, but let's take a look at history. The ancient physicians used antimicrobials to control and stop certain diseases of man and animals. Among these were plant extracts, molds from breads and from cheeses, certain kinds of soil, the salts of heavy metals and metalloids like mercury, bismuth, antimony, and arsenic. Now we have from one Marcus Varro, a mere 2,057 years ago, in his book on agriculture, a primitive statement of the germ theory of disease that there exists tiny creatures that float in the air and enter the body through the mouth and nose and cause serious diseases. Now, where there is no germ theory of disease, there is no basis for antimicrobial therapy because there would seem to be nothing to go after. And although there seems to be no reason to disavow or reject in any way the germ theory of disease, because it's quite true 
that infectious diseases are caused by microorganisms, the multifactorial causation of disease, what is really going on, seems to be of great significance to us. We will fully embrace the germ theory, but we will also point you to the multifactorial nature of even infectious disease. Claude Galien, or Galen, taught a multifactorial theory of disease causation. He also made reference to what we could call a form of the germ theory of disease. Like Marcus Varro, he could not see any microorganisms nor prove their existence, but he was able to deduce their activities from the observations that he made. Galen lived in the time of the Great Antonidan Plague, which may have been smallpox, and he lived through it, apparently to old age, and advanced much philosophy which could be of some benefit to us today. Galen saw disease as being the result of interactions of multiple factors working together. He wrote of the operational causation of disease as the result of three main factors. Rational, logical results or outcomes to actions on the body. Antecedent causes, such as situation, environment, nutrition, stress, and age. And initiating causes, such as injuries, insults to the body, and the actions of seeds of fever. The Puritan spermata, in Greek or in Latin, semina fibrum. These seeds of fever are again referencing what centuries later was called a germ theory of disease. Some have focused on the rational causes and some have focused on the antecedent causes. A balanced approach embracing all three seems to be indicated. It is interesting to note not only that Galen is referring to the action of microbes that he could not see, but also, and more importantly, I think, Galen taught that the seeds of fevers were an initiating cause, but certainly not the only cause. But since our topic for today is antibiotics and antimicrobials, we will continue looking after the germ theory and find its relevance in history and its relevance today. Faro wrote about agriculture, compiling what he had learned from others. The Romans had veterinary manuals for the care of animals. Del Garbo restated Galen's ideas about seeds of fever in 1345, but the idea of seeds of disease, microbes, and the methods by which they are spread was most famously elaborated by Hieronimo Fragastoro, who stated that contagious diseases were spread by direct contact, by fomites, and at a distance. Fragastoro had no way to understand microbes or to see them in the 16th century when he lived. Leeuwenhoek was one among the first to see the animalcules that Varro wrote about 1,700 years before. Bossi demonstrated that the muscardine disease of silkworms was caused by microbes and developed a system of sanitation, disinfection, and isolation to get rid of it. Frederick Henley advanced a complete exposition of the germ theory in 1840. He said, The material of contagions is not only an organic, but a living one, and is indeed endowed with a life of its own, which is in relationship to the diseased body, a parasitic one. Henley's postulates, the germ theory of disease, said, first of all, 
The parasite occurs in every case of the disease in question and under circumstances which can account for the pathologic changes and clinical course of the disease. He said it occurs in no other disease as a fortuitous and non-pathogenic parasite. In other words, it is not a contaminant or part of the normal flora. And number three, after being fully isolated from the body and repeatedly grown in pure culture, it can induce the disease anew. Henley's postulates were revised by Robert Cook and popularized by Cook and Louis Pasteur. The first antimicrobials. Arsenic and mercury were among the first antimicrobials and were used by Hippocrates and Galen. Antoine Bichamp developed arsenic acid in 1859, and it was still in common use until 2015. Paul Ehrlich, who discovered antibodies, popularized the use of non-toxic chemicals to kill bacteria with his use of the term Zauberkugel, which in English means magic bullets. I believe that it is useful for us to understand how we got the antimicrobials. A huge industry had developed around the production of dye stuffs for fabrics. Previously, dyes came from plants or from sea snails and was very precious. Dyes based upon aniline, originally from indigo, were found to have antibacterial properties and ways to enhance their properties were discovered. The sulfa drugs came from such studies and a Nobel Prize was given in 1932. The ancients knew about the medicinal properties of molds. The famous surgeon Dr. Bill Roth, among others, noted the antimicrobial properties of penicillium molds. Alexander Fleming further developed this idea, and penicillin was developed into an antibiotic drug before 1940. It was originally so precious that the urine from patients treated with penicillin was salvaged and the penicillin was re-extracted from their urine for the next patient. We now know that the active principle is a beta-lactam ring. What do we mean when we say antibiotics and antimicrobials? Antibiotic means any substance that opposes the development of life. Halipo, who coined this term, was a dentist. Dr. Waxman, who got a Nobel Prize in 1952, defined antibiotic as a substance produced by a microorganism that inhibits or kills other microorganisms. Antimicrobials, then, using Waxman's narrow definition, includes not only antibiotics, but also other various man-made substances such as the aniline derivatives, the furans, the quinines, the quinolones, and etc. Waxman's narrow definition is still taught in the veterinary schools and in medical schools, but the everyday use of the term antibiotic doesn't make any distinction between antibiotic and antimicrobials, and all antimicrobials and Antibiotics are simply called antibiotics. In the present day, the use of antibiotics has proceeded to the point that much genetic selection for resistance has occurred. These days, the search is on for what might seem to be antibiotic alternatives. Now, certainly a critical examination of these things would show that all of these are really antibiotics in the broad sense, but in some narrow sense, they are not antibiotics because there is no legal definition that defines them as antibiotics. And then because there is no social perception 
of them as being antibiotics, we can call them antibiotic alternatives. So then things that are man-made, such as carbidox, tiamulin, the fluoroquinolones, those are antibiotics indeed, while things like zinc oxide, thymol, benzoic acid, and essential oils are not considered to be antibiotics, but rather are able to masquerade as flavors and nutrients whenever, in fact, what we are looking at is the antibiotic properties of all of these things. So some of these things on this list do indeed kill bacteria and fungi and may, in, may even inhibit viruses in some way or the other, and therefore would be antibiotics and antimicrobials for sure. But since there is no legal definition in them in that way, we can call them antibiotic alternatives. Some of these things on this list are not really killing any bacteria, but are somehow supporting the animal in various ways that allow it to deal with infections in a more effective manner. There are three main reasons why the society is concerned about the use of antibiotics in animals and animal diets. First of all, the use of antibiotics in animals may create resistance among bacteria and animals that makes human diseases more difficult to treat. Number two, the use of antibiotics in animals may result in residues of those drugs in tissues consumed by humans, resulting in unwanted and undesirable exposures. And number three, the use of antibiotics in animals creates resistance among bacteria that makes animal diseases more difficult to treat. In the old days, a lot of the motivation for the development of antimicrobials was to find a cure for syphilis. And in the times of war, bullet wounds in the leg often proved deadly because Clostridium bacteria were carried into the gunshot wounds, and the hapless soldier either lost his leg or his life. Either way, it wasn't a good thing for the army. There have not been any truly new antibiotics created since the 1980s. In this postmodern age, it is very difficult, maybe even impossible, to develop new antibiotics because of the regulatory costs. The use of antibiotics in animals since the 1950s skyrocketed. Antibiotics are used for growth promotion and feed efficiency, used for the prevention of disease, for disease control, and for disease treatment. In the United States alone, 30 million pounds of antibiotics were used in animals in the year 2009. About 7 million pounds were used for humans. Clearly, the production and sales of antibiotics is big business. Antibiotics are something like fire extinguishers for the control of disease. We all understand what fire extinguishers are and how they're used and why they're useful. No one would imagine that the way that fires are prevented is completely reliant upon the constant application of fire extinguishing. It's absurd and ridiculous, but it is a decent analogy to the way that antibiotics are used in animal production. Several questions need to be answered whenever we make a decision to use antibiotics in animals. The first category has to do with utility. Is there any net positive result from the administration of this antibiotic? Is there a reasonable expectation of a positive result? I would dare say that most of the time we don't have a clue about either one of these things and nobody gave it any thought at all. It's just simply routine. It's done without thinking and it's often purposeless, futile, and or wasteful. The next category, the first rule of medicine from Hippocrates, is 
first of all, do no harm. Antibiotics may cause pain, nausea, lack of appetite in animals. Antibiotics can destroy the beneficial bacteria in the gut. The route of administration may be stressful to the animals in some way. When using antibiotics in animals, we must be concerned about food animal product safety. Residues of antibiotics in animal products are a very real concern. Those who are making the decision to include or administer antibiotics should have some idea about the pharmacokinetics of the drug in the animal what constitutes an appropriate dose, what's an appropriate route of administration, and what constitutes a safe withdrawal time prior to harvesting the animal products. There are possible negative effects of antibiotics that we should consider in the context of, first of all, do no harm. The cost of the product is a consideration. Often the most expensive drug is the one that does not work. Cost effectiveness is also a consideration. Sometimes the drug is more expensive than the problem. What is the effect of the drug on the animal product? Does it harm the meat? Tissue damage is a major consideration, particularly when giving a drug like tylosin or oxytetracycline in the muscle. I have frequently seen the use of medications that were intended to be used in water, such as tiamulin hydrogen fumarate, mixed with water on the farm and administered as an intramuscular injection, with, with rather dramatic negative effects, tissue swelling, muscle necrosis, and so forth. The perception that such activities have on our industry is a major concern, and we should be thankful that the public knows as little about it as they do. But it's no reason that we shouldn't clean up our act. The effect of antibiotic use on the environment is a consideration because some of these compounds may be polluting and can be detected in water in the areas around pig farms. And of course, antibiotic resistance is a major issue because of the concern that such use will result in resistance in microbes that cause disease in humans because of the plasmid transfer of genetic resistant factors. We should strive toward logical antibiotic use. First of all, establish a diagnosis a probable or presumptive diagnosis of infectious disease that might be caused by bacteria or other microorganisms that may respond favorably to the use of an antibiotic. When possible, perform antibiotic culture and sensitivity testing. We do understand that the treatment of animals in, is an emergency in one sense or the other. It may be very inconvenient to do culture and sensitivity testing, but part of the preparation for raising animals needs to be that we establish appropriate laboratory support. There is almost always time to do culture and sensitivity testing. Treatment can be started with some probable drug, and then the Culture and sensitivity testing may either confirm that the choice of the antibiotic was appropriate or it was inappropriate and a change of treatment that can then be instituted. We can start treatment right away based upon our experience and our presumptive diagnosis. The dosage frequency of dosing and the route of administration should be appropriate for the animal weight and the known bioavailability and the rate of elimination of the antibiotic. We should understand that the labeled doses may not really be reflective of the actual pharmacokinetics of the antibiotic, and those providing the treatment should know something about what's going on that's extended past the limited information that is provided on a bottle label. 
Medical records. We have some experience with medical records and the effect that it can have on the effectiveness of our treatment with antibiotics and the reduction in cost and the increase in effectiveness. It's absolutely astonishing. There needs to be a running inventory of the amount of drug on hand and then a running tally of the use of the drugs and then periodically these two things need to be added up and reconciled. Amazing findings are possible from this effort and it can do fantastic things for the farm in terms of cost reduction and the efficiency of the animal raising effort. The recording of treatments, the observations of the animals, the dosage and the identification of the animals treated, although this sounds ridiculous and odious to those who are working in the farm, it's just basic. It allows follow-up of therapy, it allows assessment of the reasons for treatment and the outcome, it allows tracking of therapy to see what's going on, what really makes sense. What we find far too often is that there's too much illogical therapy and too late treatment of cases that have a really bad prognosis. There's very poor follow-up and inadequate courses of treatment. There's illogical choices of medication. And often the animals that are being treated are hopeless cases. And euthanasia would be a much more logical and humane step than the reckless administration of drugs. Preventive medication. Uh, Preventive medication is the darling of the livestock industry. And those who are in the business of selling drugs to pig farmers uh, love this idea. Let's consider antibiotics as being like fire extinguishers. We don't use fire extinguishers as the primary means of controlling fires. Therefore, it is likewise logical that antibiotics are not the primary way that we ought to be controlling disease. Indeed, it is sometimes logical to administer systematically antibiotics at some critical stage whenever there is a known problem that is likely to occur. For example, the use of tylosin and gilts before and after transport in farms that have a history of ileitis. It's logical. On the other hand, administration of an antibiotic to piglets routinely at birth or to sows routinely at parturition is probably not logical at all, as the effect is doubtful and the outcome is doubtful and the Choice of medications is usually doubtful, and quite often the people doing the administration don't have any idea why they're doing it other than it's just simply what they do. Pigs are not born suffering from antibiotic deficiencies that require immediate heroic treatment. The right choice of antibiotic may be no antibiotic at all. We can say sometimes that nothing works better than antibiotics. And indeed, nothing may be the best choice. The use of antibiotics for growth promotion. Those who have worked in academia are aware that scientific journals will not publish negative studies showing that antibiotics do not improve the growth of healthy pigs that are raised in good environments. Because this information is seriously lacking in scientific novelty. It's been known since 1949, and therefore it will never pass the test of scientific novelty that is required by almost all scientific journals. Now, we know of a few recent cases where some information is available showing that antibiotics didn't help to improve growth. For example, Lee and Lee at China Agriculture University in 1997 showed that pigs did not respond at all to carbidox in pig feeds, and some other unpublished studies from the same group at about that time even demonstrated that antibiotics had a definite negative effect on health and growth 
because they were killing the good bacteria and leaving only the antibiotic-resistant pathogens. Wilt and Carlson in 2009 showed that healthy pigs responded positively to a supplementation of 400 ppb of biotin, but not to pharmaceutical doses of zinc oxide, nor to standard doses of carbidox. We are aware of other studies that showed a negative effect or no effect of antibiotics that were refused publication in the Journal of Animal Science simply because they did not demonstrate any scientific novelty because everyone should already know that sometimes antibiotics don't have any effect at all, particularly when administered to healthy pigs. It's just like using a fire extinguisher in the kitchen whenever there's no fire. It's certainly not a very good idea. And the analogy, uh, although perhaps shocking, is not unusual or is it wrong? Willard Wiesick at the University of Illinois demonstrated repeatedly that the excess urea from the deaminated amino acids in imbalanced animal diets led to urea cycling by the ure urease bacteria. Uh, he found that this accounts for much of the antibiotic growth promotion effect because the antibiotics suppress the urease bacteria that are robbing energy from the animal. This same effect can be obtained by using diets with better amino acid balance. This is called the ideal protein concept. What are the benefits from reducing antibiotic use? Well, there's less selection for resistant strains. There is no advantage for the bacteria to have the resistant genes if there are no antibiotics around that require those genes. If there's no antibiotics around, these genes are just extra baggage that slow the bacteria down. Enhanced susceptibility can certainly occur. We can see this and it will take some time to develop. So whenever you reduce the amount of antibiotics that are used in the farm, you can see the susceptibility to antibiotics to go up. But it may take a few months for it to happen or maybe even a couple of years, but it certainly does occur. And it's documented. A reduced cost of production. It costs money to put the antibiotics in. Improved health. If one is focusing on reducing antibiotic use, then some attention to Galen's multifactorial approach will come into play. Things will just have to be better. Better optics. There may be some good public relation effects to reducing your use of antibiotics. Let us here invoke Galen's idea of the causa antecedents the environment, and the situation of the animal. The temperature control, and air quality, and general husbandry and care, better genetic selection, and culling, better diets, all of these things will make us more money, and it can take the place of uh, antibiotics. Seriously, they will work. Galen knew what he was talking about. It's why he had... 1,600 years of positive effect on the medical profession, and it's why we still read him today. The famous statistician Florence Nightingale said something to the order of, while the germ theory of disease may indeed be so, it's no excuse not to provide good sanitation and ventilation to prevent disease. Now, while I didn't find the exact quote, it was certainly something to that effect, and you, the student, are invited to look it up. The germ theory of disease is indeed a theory per se. doesn't mean it's not true. However, excessive emphasis on the germ theory of disease 
or even excessive railing against it are both likewise unedifying. Dr. Beschamp was a rival of Louis Pasteur, and for this reason, some of his important contributions to medicine are often overlooked. Dr. Virchow is undoubtedly the unquestionable father of pathology as we know it today. However, both Beschamp and Virchow perceived some problems with the germ theory of disease and pointed out that inherited and acquired weaknesses are permissive to the progression of disease and should not be ignored. We need to have multiple tools in our toolbox. If the only tool that we have is a hammer, then every problem just looks like a nail. We're pretty thankful for what Dr. Galen brought to us. Controlling his causa pro catartica is the application of the germ theory. The use of antibiotics and antimicrobials and antibiotic and antimicrobial alternatives that masquerade as not antibiotics is not the only way. High health pigs are some work to generate and maintain. It requires a great deal of discipline and resolve, which is sometimes lacking among our business thinkers. Biosecurity to keep pathogens out, great idea. Sanitation and isolation, this was the only tool that Bassey had for controlling his disease in the silkworms, and it worked for him. All in, all out, the batch system, pig flow, vaccination programs, non-antibiotic inhibitors of microbes, and finally, judicious use of antibiotics. Keep the fire extinguisher on hand, but don't use it if you don't need it. Well, thank you very much for your attention. The last three slides in this series are your summary cards but I would advise you to go back and review this lesson over and over again and do some outside reading and study this until you, uh, until you get it down because it's a fairly deep concept. It's a long lecture, but I think that if you can get this down into uh, where you can use it uh, in your daily work, uh, it will be of great benefit to you and to our industry as well. Thank you very much.